This is Dateline News and Conversation. My guest tonight is a Russian-born American citizen, was raised for most of his life in Arizona. He went to the University of Arizona and eventually got a medical degree, and last summer returned to Russia. He's been on the show before. You know him, Dr. Lev Korovin. Lev, welcome back. Good to see you. Actually, last summer was uh, was 2021, so that was a couple summers ago already. But time flies. When yeah, you're well, fun. you know what? Time flies when you're having fun, pal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Listen, it's great to have you back. Um, <clears throat> you have a unique perspective on U.S.-Russia relations. Um, born in Russia. You grew up in the United States, you got your medical degree, and now you're back in Russia. You never were out of touch with your roots. So I want to begin tonight. <clears throat> we're going to stay on a geopolitical level rather than get down into the weeds about the war, special military operation, etc. In your opinion, is the United States isolating itself? with its conduct across the globe. It's creating havoc everywhere, creating wars, local wars, uh, extending Russia as much as it can. Uh, you have the BRICS plus a, a number of nations, just six or seven nations just joined. There's another 20 or 30 lined up that want to join. Uh, how do you see this? unfolding on a geopolitical scale is the United States isolating itself well um, the United States can isolate itself uh, to the extent that uh, uh, a bull in a, in a China shop uh, can can isolate itself unfortunately it's a uh, it's a power in decline uh, but it's a superpower in decline uh, in in that sense, uh, it may be fair to uh, compare it with the late Roman Empire. Uh, with uh, with regards to, uh, we we all know how it ended, uh, but it was a a, a decay, a, a, a decline that uh, uh, spanned a, a long time, and, uh, and and during that time, it, it did a, a a lot of damage, uh, you know, both to itself and to its surroundings. I mean, uh, overall, you know, this the situation that we have now. Uh, we previously compared it to to World War One, um, and uh, um, I think that analogy is is one that still very well uh, holds true. Like uh, it, at at the root of it all, um, you have the law of uneven development under capitalism. So you have. Uh, on the one hand, a uh, declining uh, United States that's, that's slowing down, that uh, has to struggle more and more uh, to stay at uh, the same level that it was at previously. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, you have uh, uh, this uh, uh, ec economic powerhouse uh, that, that China has turned into, which uh, now... Uh, as, as can be expected, uh, wants to uh, convert uh, that into into being a, a geopolitical uh, powerhouse as well, kind of to to the same, uh, you know, in in the same way that the German Empire uh, in in 1913 uh, was obviously uh, challenging the British Empire for, for hegemony then. Of course, uh, the, the the Brits at that time, uh, they had uh, you know a, a choice to make, uh, which uh, which was uh, either to accept uh, this this idea that some other power uh, would become number one, and in that situation, uh, it's it's not predetermined that you used to be number one, so somebody moved in front of you, and now you're number two. It it, it made not be the case at all you might you know fall to you know num number four number five uh which 
you know, uh, for for the United States, you know, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, position that it got used to uh, would would be equal to death. Okay, or uh, you can destroy your competitor. Okay, and uh, and and abort uh, uh, its growth, which is uh, what was achieved uh, fundamentally with World War One. Um, okay, it, it it aborted the the, the growth of the, of the of the German Empire, and uh, you know, in in that sense, uh, this uh, uh, passage of uh, of the rising power over the declining one didn't happen. This kind of, uh, in, in that sense, is what uh, Washington is trying to achieve. Um, to, to what degree is, is, is it isolating itself? Well, the world uh, you know, overall is, you know, at least you know, when you talk about the global south, um, it's very visibly tired. Of, uh, of of the United States of uh, this uh, hegemony that uh, it thinks that it's entitled to that it's entitled to rule the world uh, when it says jump the rest of the world uh, is, is supposed to ask how high okay that's something that, that the rest of the world is is, is sick of uh, especially you know, because it sees that uh, it's not benefit not benefiting from it uh, but. Um, then the, the 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 question is well what what's uh, what's it going to do about it um, and uh, at at this point uh, the only power uh, kind of strangely enough paradoxically enough is doing something about it is not the rising China which you would think well it has all the cards why doesn't it you know play a hand no it's Russia. Um, which, you know, in in many ways, you you would think it's one of the least equipped countries to do this, uh, but um, because uh, you know because it's doing so because uh, it's showing decisiveness. The, the rest of the world um, in this global south, like we want uh, like you know, many people in, in, in Russia and like people who um, you know, sympathize with us, you know, we, we want to say, well, it, it, it's, the, it, it's the rest of the world and, and we're aligning against the, the United States. Well, I mean, I'd be more skeptical about that. I, I, I would say that the rest of the world right now is taking uh, this uh, kind of anticipatory position that it wants to see how things are going to go, okay. And depending on how things go, it'll uh, kind of try to end up on, on on the winning side when that winning side becomes apparent. I mean, you can. It's n n not necessarily the uh, like noble. Uh, picture that you'd like to see, but I mean, you can, to, 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 to a certain degree, you, you can't really blame them because they have a, an, inst an instinct of self-preservation. So that's kind of the, the situation. You, you mentioned that the United States empire is in decline and somewhat parallels the end of the Roman empire. Uh, I, I have felt that for a long, long time now. Uh, it's characterized by corruption, uh, a, a, a loss of focus, an alienation of the people, the impoverishment, uh, impoverishment of, of the people. We see all of that happening in the United States today. And I've been reading for the last few months, but even recently, uh, I think it was in the Financial Times, predicting that the United States will enter a recession by the beginning of the next year, 2024. Um, from where you sit in Russia, 
I know most uh, Russians that I know do not believe that America is in decline in any way, shape, or form. But do you see this coming recession as a real weakening of the American hegemon? I mean, what are your thoughts on the economy? I think uh, that uh, on like a global you know, geopolitical level, the, the the recession is going to be I mean, irrelevant uh, in in the short term. Uh, what it uh, may lead to, though, uh, because I mean, regardless of you, you understand, right? There's a uh, you know, economists can draw numbers, and based on that, they can, you know, talk about, you know, is is it in a recession or is there some kind of percentage growth or whatever? And to a certain degree, that's irrelevant because people see their own lives and the lives of the people around them. And uh, uh, I mean, you can have the, the the TV, you know, spread out all sorts of, you know, fancy macroeconomic indicators, but if you know you, you you go to the gas station and uh, uh, it, it's uh, you know, con- consistently painful to, to to fill up your gas tank. If you you know go to the grocery store and uh, uh, you in order to have just like basic sustenance, uh, end up uh, coming out with a, with a grocery bill you know over over a hundred bucks you know without even. Uh, getting anything less than basic. Uh, if uh, you know you're you're a young person and, and you want to buy a house, you know, forget it. You know, it used to be um, something that Americans took relatively for granted that you know you, you could you know move out, you know, get a job and be a home homeowner. Right now, forget about it. If if you're in a big city and uh, and you're working, uh, you know. Not in some, uh, you know, very high-level professional capacity. But if you have a, a normal job that you know you used to used to have some sort of uh, dignity attached to it, maybe, maybe you're, you're one of these like striking uh, uh, automobile factory workers, right? You know, you, you you can't even barely afford rent anymore, right? Uh, I mean, with, with a situation like that, who cares if the TV is telling you that there's no recession? I mean. You, you feel the pain personally, okay? Um, in a situation like that, okay, where on the one hand, uh, you know, people are, are, are feeling, feeling the pain more and more, uh, you know, j- j- just from what's around them. But on the other hand, uh, Washington is, you know, has to gear up uh, for a major military conflict uh, that it's not going to be able uh, to uh, keep contained as a proxy war like it's doing with Ukraine right now. I mean, uh, in this American-Chinese confrontation you know, it ha- has to come eventually. It's unavoidable. Um, the uh, threat that emerges, okay, the, the kind of, you know, Two, two plus two leads to what uh, is that people who are put in a more and more desperate, you know, financial situation, economic situation, sustenance, uh, you know, multiply that by the the different, you know, strange uh, culture war things that are that are happening right now, uh, become more and more uh, receptive. Uh, to kind of uh, populist messaging, populism can 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 be, can be very different. It can be good or bad. Okay, in and of itself, it, it, it it's it's uh, simply uh, you know appealing to to the common man as uh, as opposed to uh, trying to uh, go after you know interest groups or uh, or, or what have you. It, it's a uh, you know, trying to to to, to appeal to, uh, to 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 the common individual. It's supposed to, it's supposed to be you know you you think a good thing, uh, with the exception that uh, of course uh, uh, you know 
di different kinds of uh, extreme uh, right populism, for, uh, for example. Uh, you have uh, uh, humanity's uh, very painful experience, um, uh, you know, in, in the first half of the 20th century, first in Mussolini's Italy, then, then in Nazi Germany. Um, also, people were, were, were suffering, you know, big time uh, from wars around them. The Italians were, were impoverished. The Germans in, 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 in Weimar Germany, okay, when uh, you, you had to, to pay a, a million plus uh, marks to, to buy a loaf of bread, okay, uh, they were in pain. They, they, they were looking for something, you know, to, 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 to fix their problem. And they got uh, this promise in, in, in the form of, of this uh, mad Fuhrer who, who then uh, uh, exterminated you know, tens of millions of people, all right? And I think that the United States, uh, with a combination of, um, you know, macroeconomics be damned, the, 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 the life of the common man, okay, and uh, this preparation for war is is uh, heading full steam ahead for for something like this for for one form of uh, of, of Nazification or another. In in this sense, uh, this uh, Ukrainian thing was only the beginning. Um, you know, Russia and China apparently have come closer together. Uh, over the last couple of years, but certainly very accelerated since the Russian special military operation in Ukraine. They apparently are together on many levels, including military, technology, development, the uh, one bridge, one road, new Silk Road, etc. But something huge, I think, just happened. Kim Jong-un, from the DPRK, uh, North Korea, came to Eastern Russia. He met with Putin. He met with other high-level people in the government, in, in industry, and in even the nuclear industry. Lev, I want to know what you think, from where you're sitting, this meeting of Kim Jong-un in Russia and Putin, what significance does it have on a global level? Well, for the last, for the previous 30 years, okay, uh, of Russian foreign policy, uh, at least from uh, before, uh, the, the 24th of February, uh, 2022, Russia wanted uh, uh, to be, uh, in, in one form or another, uh, part of this uh, you know, system that, that, that the West was building, that, that the United States was building. It, it um, was trying to, you know, uh, with, with, the, with the attempts to, you know, keep a semblance of dignity or, or, or what have you, uh, but it wasn't the positioning itself actively as uh, uh, any kind of global alternative. It, it wanted to be uh, part of this uh, as, um, side that, uh, um, well, that had the power right. And uh, in that situation, if uh, you asked uh, a uh, major uh, Russian government bureaucrat, hey, who do you want to deal with, South Korea or North Korea, you know, 10 out of 10 uh, would have said South Korea. Okay. Now, uh, life has changed. Okay. Uh, many of these uh, people in high places may not even realize to what extent life has changed. But, uh, I mean, Putin at the very least sees that uh, in a situation where uh, the United States and its satellites, including you know South Korea, 
have declared one form of war against you or another, okay, you know, let's not kid ourselves that, 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 that this is uh, some sort of uh, isolated uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict. It's a, it's a proxy war of the entire West against Russia. And South Korea is uh, participating in that, uh, you know, majorly. It's, it's signed up for, for all the sanctions. It's, you know, uh, when, when, when it's asked to um, aid the neo-Nazi regime in Kiev, you know, it will do so with alacrity. I mean, who are we kidding? In that sense, you want to stop trying to um, come to uh, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, relationship, trying to knock on, on locked doors and try to be friends with people who very obviously just don't want to be friends with you. And you have to value the friends that you have. Okay. The DPRK, okay, you know, first the Soviet Union, then, then Russia, it, it has a, a long history okay, together. Um, you know, it uh, started with uh, even World War II when uh, uh, Kim Jong Un's grandfather, you know, Kim Il Sen, um, uh, was uh, was amongst those who were uh, fighting the the Japanese, okay, with Soviet assistance, and then that um, ended up uh, uh, you know, blossoming uh, into um, uh, ha having this uh, uh, you know, split Korea system, right? And uh, the North Koreans. Um, in a certain sense, uh, have always been you know, a, a bit more forward-looking uh, than the post-Soviet um, Russian state in the sense that they've uh, preserved uh, their military-industrial complex. Right now, uh, there's work that's being done in Russia, don't get me wrong, but a lot more work has to be done in order to keep up with and outpace uh, the combined military industrial complex of the entire West, which is also going to be uh, ramping up very sharply because they have to equip not only the current proxy war now, they have to prepare for uh, this uh, global showdown with China. Okay, and if there's one thing that uh, this current uh, uh, special military operations is, is, is showing anybody is that modern uh, intermediate war uh, eats through munitions in eats through weapons uh, much faster than anybody was ever used to. Um, of course, you know, uh, Russia figured out you know that uh, it, it has to ramp up. You know, its uh, its production has to, uh, you know, look to uh, additional sources to make sure that uh, the, the troops have what they need uh, in order to to get the job done. Uh, but uh, you know, it was a, a major surprise for for the Americans too. I think partially because they they just didn't expect uh, everything to, to last so long. They 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 thought that. Uh, Russia was much uh, weaker uh, internally, and, uh, and, and for, for this reason, they thought that uh, the Russian front would collapse, not necessarily because of some sort of Ukrainian military gains, but, but because of uh, internal unrest within Russia. And they thought that, well, if you combine uh, battlefield gains in Ukraine with a, a fragile situation in Russia, then you get what you need. And you don't have to work so hard. And then the next situation you have is that, well, Russia collapses, you know, uh, the Russian-Chinese border becomes uh, essentially another border that's under American control. And that's a very uh, good position to wage this uh, showdown against China with, okay, because, you know, the, the clock is ticking. They, they have to, to uh, move at, at one point or another. Now, uh, 
game in Ukraine, the uh, much touted uh, Ukrainian offensive that was supposed to happen uh, has generated a little more uh, than the many tens of thousands of, of dead uh, uh, Ukrainian military. Um, okay. it, it's, uh, it's eating through uh, money and resources of the West. It's eating through time. Okay. Washington thought that at this point, uh, when, when, when this whole thing was about to begin, uh, when, when they were playing the, their calculus in, in, in the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022, that this would all be over by now, that, that, that they would be um, you know, in, in the position uh, uh, to deal with uh, their main existential threat as, as they see it. Now they're losing time uh, and uh, are, are sitting uh, in, in a much weaker position that, that, that they would. So right now uh, we're faced with uh, a new arms race, not simply Russia versus the United States, but um, of uh, the combined West uh, with Russia and uh, whoever uh, you know, is, uh, wants to support us with uh, uh, a little bit more than, than, than just uh, wishful words, which in, in that sense, of course, both the, the contribution of uh, Iran and the, and the, the contribution of, uh, of uh, DPRK, North Korea, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's a big deal. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it is a very big deal. Um, you know, the rapprochement with North Korea, Iran, uh, other uh, independent countries in the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, I, I think it is a big deal. I have never bought into the concept of a proxy war in Ukraine. Uh, I'm of the belief that the United States for decades has been ramping up its attacks on the Soviet Union and then the Russian Federation. They haven't ceased. They've got increasingly more belligerent and hostile. Uh, the rhetoric has become more hostile. And for them to keep repeating that Russia uh, illegally invaded Ukraine is just an out-and-out -out lie. Um, it's very mendacious. All of it has been very mendacious. Uh, Russia has been seriously provoked for decades. And, you know, they can say it's a proxy war. But, you know, it just reported yesterday or the day before that the Russians shot blew up a, a German leopard tank, mm -hmm. and the crew were all Germans. German army. Bundeswehr. German army. German they weren't army. even mercenaries. They, they were... German you know, just, army. Just that, yeah. And I, I, know, I know for a fact there have been American military people boots on the ground, Canadians boots on the ground, UK boots on the ground, French and others including Poles, many Poles, mm -hmm. maybe thousands. And to call this a proxy war, to me, is um, it's just not calling it what it is. It's an out-and-out -out war of the United States declining empire against Russia, which right now is the only country that has been able to militarily counter and defeat the resources of NATO and the United States. Now, I think this is huge, but Lev, what I really think is going on, and what we started talking about is the United States isolating itself from the rest of the world. If we look at this from a geopolitical perspective, I believe, and I want your opinion on this, 
that this is the epic, the epic battle for control of the future order of the world between a declining hegemon, the United States, and a new world that appears to be emerging, you can call it a multipolar world, a more fair world, a world that is going to uh, adhere to the strict interpretation of international law and the UN Charter. Do you see this on that level as the epic battle between two poles for the future order and control of the planet? I think this is the beginning of an epic battle that is going to last, last uh, uh, if we're lucky, the better part of the 21st century. If we're lucky uh, in, in terms of that, uh, uh, if, if it's going to continue, it, it means that uh, there's uh, our side, okay, uh, which uh, I mean, you can talk about uh, uh, declining U.S. all you want, but we, we know that you know Russia is the underdog here. I mean, it's uh, uh, not even uh, uh, something that's uh, that's worth arguing about. Um, I think that uh, it's not something that uh, is going to end uh, with Ukraine. Okay, this is uh, simply the beginning of a series of flashpoints and a uh, series of major wars that, um, uh, at one point or another. Uh, is going to uh, culminate in, in, into something that is going to be truly uh, world order changing. Uh, okay, I mean, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily um, uh, apply uh, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, uh, rose colored glasses uh, to. Uh, multipolar world. I mean, multipolar world is, is simply what the world has always been prior to 1945. Okay. Before that, the world was always multipolar. The, the, the emergence of, of two major superpowers changed it to a bipolar one, which to a degree, uh, while it lasted, was more stable. And you can argue that the Cold War, because we have this balance of power, um, saved much more lives than uh, you know could have been potentially taken in a different situation. We are coming back to you know the multipolar world. I would say now, okay, it's already multipolar, okay, and because of that, okay. Uh, we're having what we're what we're having, okay. Uh, in, in in that situation, you well, know, there's nothing to do but win. You have to win. Uh, <laughs> wow, uh, that's interesting. I I kind of thought that uh, it was all being played out right now, and with the the powerful forces in the West and the United States uh, being threatened with a loss of their domination might do something totally radical and unthinkable. And people are talking about it now on both sides. Mm -hmm. Will somebody be crazy enough to push the button or will some accident happen, a misjudgment that could lead to the unthinkable. That's why I'm saying, if we're lucky, this is going to last for decades and decades. If, if we're lucky. Because if we're yeah. unlucky, it's, it's going to end painfully much quicker. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I want to finish on this note, Lev. Um, you know, since Russia was deceived over the Minsk agreements, that 
the West had no intention of those agreements being honored. It was a period of time when Ukraine was rearmed and prepared and trained to launch a, an offensive against Russia, the Donbass. But since that time, the rhetoric coming from Russia, from Putin himself, he said things like, we're moving east. The West is not to be trusted. America cannot be trusted. And instead of talking about our partners in the West and in America, Putin started talking about unfriendly countries. And just last week at the United Nations, Putin did not go to give a speech. It was Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, a brilliant man. I think he stands alone on the world stage in terms of the consummate diplomat. He came out and he called the United States untrustworthy. He called it an empire of lies. I know you're familiar with that speech. You and your international media site, um, Rosa, uh, Rosa Primavera, which I want to put the link to that site uh, on this video. Uh, what was your take on Lavrov's speech at the United Nations? Oh, it's. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, Confucius who said that you know uh, the, the first step uh, to uh, overcoming in, in a catastrophe is to call things by their proper names and to say those names in all the marketplaces. Where you know, at that time, you know, the, the marketplace was where uh, you you went in order for everybody to hear you. Um, at this point, uh, you know, we, we can say finally uh, that uh, we, uh, you know, in, you know the, in, in the form of, of the president and uh, uh, through the foreign minister, are calling things by by their proper names. Okay, in, in, in that sense, you know, if you're fighting an empire of lies, then I mean, the only way that you can win is with the truth. And that's part of it. Uh, obviously, I, I believe that Russia has taken that position. And I think very publicly uh, on the global platform. Uh, I think Russia, as, as you said, is finally calling things as they are, calling out the United States on a number of different levels. Forget about the West. Forget about NATO. It's the powerful forces in the United States that are driving this agenda, and I, I think you would agree. Um, do you think that Russia is doing everything it can to avoid a, as everybody's saying, a direct war with NATO or the United States? I think it's going to you know, very great lengths in order to do that. Uh, I mean, you can even argue that, you know, are, are we being excessively prudent uh, with uh, the current uh, uh, situation that uh, perhaps, you know, again, part of uh, this whole, you know, calling things by their proper names uh, is, of course, uh, you know, calling somebody's bluff, you know what I mean? And um, in the, a situation where the other side is, uh, you know, trying to, you know, kind of. It, it, it part of the uh, modern war uh, is not only 
on the battlefield, it's not only you know in, in the economical realm, it's not only in the political realm. It's also the the picture that you're you're painting. It's it's the informational realm, and uh, the West is doing uh, a lot of things that that are trying to make us look weak, um, like uh, uh, we can't uh, uh, guarantee uh, necessarily the, the the security of uh, you know people who are our allies or. Uh, people who uh, simply, you know, have, have placed their trust in us, and uh, you know, again, if if it's if it's an empire of lies and it's uh, and spewing out lies, then you have to fight those lies, uh, you know, a with the truth and b with action. Okay, and so it's a very. Hmm, it's a, a very delicate and very high stakes balancing act because on the one hand, you know, nobody uh, wants a world destroying nuclear exchange. But on the other hand, okay, you do not want um, to come off, and I'm, I'm making this uh, pause deliberately to kind of be very precise here. You don't want uh, to come off as somebody who fears death more than your adversary. Because it's in that situation, okay, where uh, one can say, well, you're afraid of death and I'm not, and therefore I deserve to be the master and you deserve to be the slave. Okay, that is an unacceptable, an unacceptable position. Okay, in that sense, okay, if uh, if you're playing a, you know, th this kind of game of chicken, this game of geopolitical chicken, you have to play it. Okay, it's a very hard game to play, but again, you have no choice but to win because. Everything else uh, is going to be either death or something much worse. Well, you know, uh, Washington continues to escalate almost on a daily basis the threats and direct attacks on Russia, um, one day after another, crossing another Russian red line. Uh, you have mentioned that Russia has shown incredible restraint in this geopolitical game. But as we look at what's happening in the neighborhood, in the region, the United States right now has been stirring up trouble in Armenia with Azerbaijan. Turkey is involved in that. Israel is involved in that, and Iran, and that's why Israel's involved. And there are massive protests. There are armed conflicts going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan as we speak today. At the same time, the United States is involved with NATO in Serbia and Kosovo. There's been violence breaking out there. The United States has been trying, I think, to distract Russia, to exhaust Russia, to spread Russia thin with all of these moves. And yet Russia continues to play this, as you said, very delicate and dangerous game. I don't think Russia's playing chicken, but a dangerous game of trying to avoid the unthinkable, your thoughts. You know, um, I don't know how much time we have uh, to talk about Ar Armenia, Azerbaijan, and, uh, and Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, it's uh, um, something with a very long uh, backstory. And it was one of the first flashpoints um, that uh, uh, came up uh, in the late 80s, while the Soviet Union still existed, it was one of the 
uh, triggers for uh, for its collapse, might, one might argue. Um, and right now, uh, what we have, I mean, it's it, it's it's something you, you you can see it from a mile away. Uh, it's uh, uh, Washington isn't doing anything new right now. It's simply uh, dusting off uh, old plans uh, that were drawn up. Uh, under Jimmy Carter uh, and and then under Ronald Reagan, uh, which which is the idea of uh, uh, destroying uh, the the Soviet Union uh, by uh, clashing national minorities against each other and and uh, uh, building uh, this uh, so-called ring of fire uh, around the around the Russian heartland. And uh, I mean, right now. Uh, uh, you, you have the, the Armenian flashpoint that uh, uh, has, uh, has started burning again. Uh, the, the, the next step, and, and this is just, you know, the, the writing is just, just on the wall. Um, the next step is um, uh, going to be the reignition of other frozen conflicts uh, in the post-Soviet space. It's going to be uh, around Georgia and South Ossetia, Georgia and, and, and Abkhazia. It's going to be around uh, you know, Moldavia and, and with it, Romania uh, against Transnistria. Uh, and uh, to a very likely degree, it's uh, going to be attempts to further uh, destabilize and to set fire to Central Asia. Okay, with, with uh, the, the help of, you know, one form of... Uh, you know, use uh, uh, radical Islamism or or, or, or whatnot. You know, why uh, did uh, the the Americans leave uh, leave Afghanistan it's to to turn it into um, another like boiling cauldron of chaos that can then spill somewhere else? And somewhere else is north. Okay, it has to spill north. Then uh, you know uh, what Washington wants is to give Russia not a two-front war, uh, but uh, something even more uh, multidimensional to deal with, okay? Um, there's, uh, there's some people, you know, in, in Russia you hear that, well, this like Nagorno-Karabakh situation, uh, okay, it's, uh, you know, why uh, should it be of Russia's concern that, that uh, you know the the current uh, you know prime minister of, of Armenia, Nikol uh, Pashinyan, it's uh, uh, th this whole uh, catastrophe is uh, one of his making, and you know he's trying to uh, you know push Armenia uh, out of uh, the uh, you know all, all of the you know pro-Russian. Um, structures out of the collective security uh, treatment organization wants to you know tie it to NATO, um, all all these things and and, and so at, at one point well oh what why should uh, uh, Russia be even involved? And the answer is well Russia has to be involved in a conflict that is a very close to it b deals with people, especially those uh, uh, people in Nagorno-Karabakh who, you know, we made a certain promise to in terms of, you know, the, the, that we're going to not allow their blood to be spilled. Uh, and they believed us. Okay. Um, you, you have to, you know, if you make promises, you have to keep them because otherwise your word means nothing. Okay, and in that situation, you, know, uh, you, you can't uh, be the empire of truth uh, that can uh, wage a real uh, multidimensional war against an empire of lies because you're just as big a liar as they are. Okay, um, so in, in that situation, you have to confirm that you exist. Okay, and that's why it's important, because otherwise the next step is, you know, you, you allow blood to be spilled close to your border, next time the blood's going to be spilled inside your border. 
and I, I think everybody uh, who, who 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 makes decisions who um, who who understands what what's at stake it, it's something everybody gets. I want to finish on this note, Lev. Um, we've been talking about these regional conflicts and the rebirth, uh, the resurrection of previous conflicts. But one thing that I have been concerned about for a number of years now, and it's intensifying, is the scale and the frequency of the U.S.-NATO war games in the Black Sea, all along Russia's borders, and in the Arctic on a 24-7 basis. These war games are planning a direct attack on Russia by land. They, 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 they plan that. They, they plan these games to do that on the sea, the Arctic, the Black Sea, um, and in the air with long-range bombers, bombers that are nuclear capable, as well as fighter jets that are nuclear capable at taking off from Romania, from Poland, from God knows where else. And these games have got to appear to Russia as one day representing the real thing. Your thoughts on this before we finish, Lev? You know, Donald Rumsfeld said, um, you know, uh, that weakness is provocative. Okay. And, uh, you know, all, all this uh, telegraphing that you see, it, it means one thing. Okay. It means that, a, you know, they're, they're pressed for time because they have to uh, defeat us before uh, they can go head to head with China. At least that's the current thinking in, in, in the current administration. I don't know what a, um, what what might surface, uh, you know, later in, in like after twenty twenty four. But uh, the this uh, uh, democratic, uh, you know, Langley establishment uh, is convinced that. Uh, before the the terminal confrontation with with China, they they have to finish Russia off, okay, and whether or not they try to go for it really depends on on, on one thing: it's their perception of the winnability of such a war uh, in conditions that satisfy them okay that they see as acceptable okay and that, that, that's the, the, the whole thing you, you you have to demonstrate that you exist that attempts to wage uh, this kind of uh, war to, to finish you off uh, are not going to end well for the side that decides to launch it. Because not only do you have the means to inflict unacceptable damage to the other side, but you also have the willpower to do it, okay? Nobody cares that you have a gun in your hand if they are convinced that you don't have the balls to pull the trigger. If if both of those conditions are met, then the enemy is going to think twice before he does something to, uh, to test your capabilities and your resolve. The moment that either one of those comes into doubt, that's when they're going to jump. 